2 Kings chapter number 19. Good to feel the presence of the Lord, the wind and the breath of the Holy Spirit. God can do more in just a few moments with a touch and a breath of the Holy Spirit than we can ever do in our lives in the energy of the flesh. And it's good to be around a bunch of people that's not ashamed of the gospel. Not ashamed of the Lord because we don't have anything to be ashamed of. And I'm glad this morning that God is still on the throne. He's alive and well and he still hears and he answers prayer. I'm glad he'll save anybody and everybody that'll call upon his name. I'm glad the ground is level at the foot of the cross. I love Brother C.T. and Becky and the family, and I thank the Lord for the burden that God's put upon him for revival. And it thrills a man like me. I'm not old yet, but I'm on the way. I'm an almost old man. Some of you are older than I am, and you've been old for years. But it thrills my heart to see another generation coming along, preaching the Bible, and singing someday and enjoying the blessings of God. And not ashamed to lift a hand and shout a little bit. And I'm glad today the Lord is good to us. Turn to somebody to do your right and say, you look good today. You really do. You look good. Now turn back around and say, I was lying. I didn't mean a word of it, praise God. 2 Kings this morning, chapter number 19. And I'm going to take a four-hour sermon and squeeze it into two hours. Amen. 2 Kings chapter 19 this morning in verse number 14. And Hezekiah received the letter of the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord. Notice he went up to the house of the Lord and any time you make your direction towards God, it's always up. He went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God. Even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. Notice his cry before the Lord, Lord, bow down now thine ear and hear. Open, Lord, thine eyes and see and hear the words of Sennacherib, which had sent him to reproach the living God. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have destroyed the nation's and their lands, and have cast their, notice little g, their gods into the fire. For they were no gods, but the works of men's hands, wood and stone, therefore they have destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord our God, say this with me, I beseech thee, save thou us. Say that with me, save thou us. Say that with me again. Save thou us out of his hand, that all of the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God, even thou only. For the sake of time, come down, if you will, to verse number 35. And it came to pass that night. And it came to pass that night. I don't know what God did other nights, but I know what he did that night. And it may have been night in their life, but God was still at work. Hallelujah, aren't you glad the God of the day whoop, is still God in the night. And the God on the mountain is still God down in the valley. Well, glory, that's not my text, but I like that. And it came to pass, said with me, that night. And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians 104, and, 104 score and 5,000. 
And when they rose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. I'm interested this morning in that little phrase found in Hezekiah's prayer where he said, I beseech thee, and that word means I beg thee, save thou us. And for a few moments this morning, I want to preach on this subject on a young man that got a hold of God. And when that young man got a hold of God, his whole nation was saved. And how many would agree with me this morning that if God could hear the prayer of just one young man and an entire nation is saved from destruction, how many believe that same God can hear the prayer of someone in this room this morning and answer that prayer and save our nation. I believe all of us would agree this morning that America needs revival. And the only one that can give America the revival that she needs is God. We have seen what politics can do. Someone asked me what kind of politicians we got. We got the best that money can buy. And we have seen what religion without God can do. We have seen what money cannot do. We have seen what organizations can do. But I wonder if there's anybody in this room this morning, you're hungry to see what God can do. We come to this text and one of my favorite Bible characters, a young man by the name of Hezekiah. He was just a very, very young man when he went to the throne. And the first three years of his reign, God used this young man to bring restoration and renewal and revival to his nation. If you'll study the life of Hezekiah, you'll find that his daddy was a heathen. His daddy was a rascal. His daddy was a wicked man. But here's a man that chose to go above his raisin and live for God. And the Bible said he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And may I just insert this this morning. You may be here. And you say, Brother Joe, I don't come from a Christian family and I don't have a Christian heritage. Well, you determine this morning by the grace of God that you're going to go home and, and start you a legacy for God and you start a Christian heritage and live for God in your life. God greatly used this young man. But we all know that any time the Lord begins to bless, Satan will begin to fight. And the powers of hell came against this young man. And Satan tried to do everything that he could to undo the good that he has done. And when you come to this text, he is fighting the battle of his life. In this time in his life, he needs God more than he's ever needed God in his life before. And I'm glad the story ends with this boy getting a hold of God and God got a hold of him and God moved in a mighty way. And aren't you glad this morning the God we serve, he is the alive God. He is the able God. He is the awesome God. But he is the accessible God and he is the available God and he is a God that can be touched with the feelings of our infirmity. Three things about his prayer in the text. Number one, I want you to see this morning the threat of the enemy. The threat of the enemy. Hezekiah is sitting upon his throne one day and he gets a letter. He gets a letter from King Sennacherib and in that letter is a threat. And in that letter, he threatens this young man, I'm coming for you. I'm coming for your family. I'm coming for your home. I'm coming for your kingdom. I'm coming from your gold. I'm coming from everything that's dear and precious to you. I'm going to come and wipe you and your nation and everything that you hold dear off of the face of the earth. And may I say this this morning about this threat. Sennacherib, this ungodly king, he was not bluffing. He was not kidding. He said, Hezekiah, if you don't believe I'm telling you the truth, he said, just look around. 
at what I have done to all the other nations. Look what I have done to all of the other kings around you. Look how I have destroyed them and, and their family and their way of life. Look at all the pillage and destruction I've caused around and what I've did to others I'm going to do to you. Can I remind you this morning that God's church has never been threatened like it's being threatened today. Can I remind you that this United States of America is being threatened today like she's never been threatened before. Can I remind you our religious freedoms have never been more threatened than they are in this day and in this hour in which we live. Because let me remind you this morning there are powers that be and forces that are at work in this nation. They will destroy your life and your mind and your family and your pastor and your church and your freedom and everything that we hold dear. Because we are living in a society when seeming leaders have lost their ever-loving mind. We are discussing things that should not even be discussed. You know you are living in a sad state when rulers don't even respect the life of the unborn. I mean when governors and mayors make statements like, well, if the abortion goes bad and the baby is still alive and, and nobody wants it to live, we'll just take its life off of the table. You gotta be barbaric to believe that. Whoever believed that we would be in a nation that would argue about what bathroom you ought to use. I told our people the other day, I said, if I catch some of you men in that lady's bathroom, we're going to need some more handicapped restrooms around here. Boy, they're after the mind and the heart and the souls of our young people. And we are being threatened. Our way of life is being threatened. Our religious freedom is being threatened. And it is a real threat. This world is not bluffing. The devil is not bluffing. The devil's real and he's powerful and he's mad. And he wants you and he wants me. And he wants the minds of our young people. But aren't you glad the Bible said that greater is he that is in you and he that is in the world. And there's some things this morning worth rolling up our sleeves and fighting over and standing for because God is good and its truth shall endure forever. Man, it is a threat from the enemy. And I see Hezekiah as he reads this letter. I can see him turn ashy white. I can see the cold sweat as it runs down his face. I can see the grimacing look upon his face as he reads this letter and he knows Sennacherib is not bluffing. All he's got to do is look around and he sees the destruction and this threat is real and this threat is horrible. But all of a sudden I see somebody standing beside of Hezekiah and he looks at the young man and he says, now what are you going to do? Our military is not enough. Our money's not enough. Our resources is not enough. This enemy's bigger than us. This foe is bigger than us. What in the world are we going to do? Well, notice what he did in our text. After Hezekiah read the letter, the first thing the Bible said he did, he went up into the house of the Lord. In our language, you know what he said? I'm a going to church. I'm a going to church. I'm going to worship God. I'm going to where God dwells with his people. And aren't you glad in this world that threatens you and I and in this world that comes against you and I, there is a place that we can go called the house of the Lord. And may I say in these days of apathy and in these days of apostasy, it's not less church. It's not less Bible. It's not less God. It's going to be more church and more Bible and more God 
God. I mean, we're in Hebrews 10, 25 land, exhorting one another, not less of, but so much the more. As you see the day approaching, we need the Holy Ghost like we've never needed the Holy Ghost. We need the blood of Christ like we've never needed the blood of Christ. We need the Bible like we've never needed the Bible. And we need the house of God and the church of God and the move of God like we've never needed it before. It's not time to quit. It's not time to turn back. It's time to get our Bibles and get our family and say, we're going to church. Woo! He said, we're going to the house of the Lord. And that leads me to point number two, the one I'm about to explode to preach all morning. I see the threat from the enemy, but secondly, I see the travail with the eternal. I see the travail with the eternal. Hezekiah walks in that house of the Lord. He's got that threatening letter in his hand and he goes up to the altar and he lays it before God. He takes his burden to the Lord and leaves it there. Someone said, all them people want to go coming to the altar. What were they doing? They were doing like Hezekiah. They're taking their burden to the Lord and they're leaving it there. You say, but I don't understand some people. They go to the altar every time we have church. You look up in here. I'm not worried about them who go to the altar every time we have church. I'm worried about them who ain't been to the altar since Moby Dick was a minnow. After 35 years in the same church, I promise you, it's not those frequent altar goers that have church splits and talk about the preacher. It's them that don't ever go to the altar. You say, well, they went down there last night. Why'd they go back down there this morning? I can answer that. Anybody here ever ate a Krispy Kreme donut? More than once. If you don't raise your hand, you're the biggest liar that's ever been. Because if you ever eat one of them awesome things, anointed with heavenly manna from on high, make sure mouth water just to look at it. And when that sign on hot now that says God's will, pull in, God's will, pull in. And man, you look at that thing, it's a work of art. And you take the first bite and it's a half moon. And you take that second bite and it's a total eclipse. I mean, you know why you eat Krispy Kreme? over and over cause you like the way it tastes. Somebody said I don't understand. They went to the altar last night and they went back this morning. Yep and they just may go back again tonight because there was a God in that altar that heard their prayer and touched their life and lifted their burdens. I'm glad there's a place where we can run to when all hell breaking loose in our life and he spread it before the Lord. Lord, here it is. And son, I saw this the other day operating a motor vehicle. And I had to pull over and have me a spell. Actually, somebody else pulled me over and I tried to share it with them, but they were not spiritually minded. He brings this letter before the Lord and notice his prayer, how he words it. Oh, Lord that dwelleth between the cherubims. You say, what in the world does that mean? Where well, notice where he is at. He is at the temple. He is before this veil. He is in the holy place, but he is not in the holy of holies. He's before this veil. And on the other side of that veil is the Ark of the Covenant, which represents the manifested presence of God. On top of the Ark of the Covenant is a golden lid called the mercy seat. On top of that mercy seat is the red shimmering blood of the innocent sacrifice. And on top of the blood 
in the Shekinah glory and manifested glory of all mighty God. And you know what this man is doing? He is praying through that veil. He is praying to that God that dwells in that holy of holies. And you know what he is saying? God, I got a burden that's too big for me. I've got a threat that I cannot handle. I've got a battle that I cannot win. But Lord, I am approaching you on the basis of your presence. You are a God that is with us. And I'm hanging my hat and my hopes and my dreams and my family on a God who is present. Lord, I know you are a merciful God. And I got a problem I can't solve. I got a mountain I can't climb. I've got a need that I can't meet. And all I know to do, Lord, is hang it on your mercy. Oh, God, have mercy upon me. He is saying, Lord, I know the blood is shed. The blood of the sacrifice has been applied. And Lord, my problems are too big. My mountains are too high. And my burdens are too heavy. But I'm hanging my hopes. And I'm hanging my nation. And I'm hanging my family on the blood of the sacrifice. And God, I know you are wrapped up in glory. For you are the Lord of glory. And the sum total of glory. And the epitome of glory. You're the glorious God. And Lord, for my problems and my burdens and my troubles. I'm laying it in your glory. I'm putting it on your glory. God, if your presence will help me, if your mercy will help me, if your blood will help me, if your glory will help me, God, I can make it through what I'm a going through. I've come to tell you this morning when the mountain's too high and the ocean's too wide and the valley's too deep and the burden's too heavy, go to God in prayer and say, God, God, I leave it in your presence. God, I hang it on your mercy. God, I plead the blood. And God, may the glory come down. Aren't you glad there's a God who is present? There's a God who is merciful. There is a God who propitiates in blood. And there's a God that's full of glory. It's not too big for God. It's not too hard for God. When God is all you got, he's all you need. Woo! He's begging God's presence, God's mercy, God's blood, and God's glory. You say, that's pretty good. Yeah, but it gets better. Did you know we got one up on Hezekiah? Did you know we're in better shape than Hezekiah. Did you know it's even more real for us than Hezekiah? You say, Lord, have mercy. How can it get any better for us than him? Well, notice, he's a king, but he's not a priest. He's a king, but he's not a priest. As a king, he has authority. But because he's not a priest, he doesn't have access. He can pray through the veil. He can come to the veil. He can get close to the veil. But because he doesn't have access, he cannot go in. He prays through that veil. Prays to the presence of God. Prays to the mercy of God. Prays to the blood of God. Prays to the glory of God, but he cannot go in. You say, what has that got to do with us? I'm so glad you asked. Revelation 1, 5 said, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and made us kings and priests. Kings and priests. When he died on bloody Calvary, he split that veil from top to bottom. And now I don't pray through, I pray in. I don't get close, I go in. I don't stand on the outside, I go in his presence. I go in his glory. I go in his mercy. I go in his blood. I'm not on the outside looking in. I'm on the inside looking up. Hallelujah. Mm. Woo. Oh, that veil, you 
Ghost. <laughs> that veil used to say, you're all lost heathens. Keep out of here. But she's been rent from top to bottom. And that said, let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace that we might obtain grace and mercy and help in the time of need. You say, Brother Joe, the threat is real. The burden is heavy. The mountain is high. The battle's hot. I know that. But we can go in to the Holy of Holies and beg for God's presence and beg for God's mercy and claim the precious blood of the sacrifice and walk around in the glory of God. It's not bigger than God. It's not more mighty than God. For greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Lay it at the foot of the cross. He's God. He knows what's going on. And just when I thought it couldn't get no better, Brother Heath, it hit me again. Oh, glory, glory, glory. Hezekiah could get close. He could pray through. You and I draw near, go in. You say, what can be better than that? Hold on now. I know most of you come from a Baptist church, but you may act a little non-Baptist right here. Let me just say, if you're here and You've always wanted to like lose it and go, whoo, here's a good place to lose it and go, whoo. Brother Joe, how can it get better than I can go in the very presence of God? Boy, when I studied that temple and that tabernacle, I thought, man, isn't it amazing that a building can be so beautiful that God would move in it? Oh, but then I came the first Corinthians chapter number six where it said that my body whoop, was a temple of the Holy Ghost. You say, preacher, what's better than you and I walking in the Holy of the Holies? It's when the Holy of Holies walked in here and lives in here and resides in here. The presence is here. The mercy is here. The blood is here. Christ in you, the hope of glory. I got him in here. Woohoo! Well, glory. I felt like that little girl in Sunday school teacher was teaching Christ in you the hope of glory Brother Billy she raised her hand and she said teacher I don't understand she said well don't you understand baby she said if God is so big and I'm so little if that big old God lives in little old me he gonna stick out somewhere I want to tell you what America needs to see, what our schools need to see, what our neighborhoods need to see is somebody that's got a hold of God and God's got a hold of them and he sticks out in them and he shows out upon them. Aren't you glad there is a God who's present, who's merciful, who's blood forgiven, who lives in glory? I'm glad the God in that temple is the God in me. Hallelujah, what a Savior. We got somebody to call on in the difficult time. The threat from the enemy, the travail with the eternal. And I close with this, I want you to see the triumph that was experienced. Look at verse number 35. It said, and that night, boy, I love Hezekiah. You know what I love about him? Number one, he went to church. Number two, he called on God. And after he went to church and called on God, you you know what he did, number three? He went home, went to bed, and went to sleep. That's exactly what he did. 
You say, well, why did he go home and go to bed and go to sleep? What else could he do? He'd already done what he's supposed to do. Hezekiah, how in the world can you sleep with an enemy out there like that? He said, because I done prayed to that God that's in him. And that God that's in here is bigger than that enemy that's out there. And so I'm going to rest. Old brother Billy Kelly, he's been with the Lord 23 years. He was one of my heroes. We both were going through something one time. And I said, brother Billy, I said, you're doing two things and I'm not doing well. He said, what's that? I said, eating and sleeping. When I'm upset, I can't eat. When I'm upset, I can't go to sleep. He didn't bother Brother Billy none. He, he said, bless God, ain't nobody going to tear up my eating. He said, son, some people pray their way out. Some people word their way out. Some people fret their way out. He said, I've never seen a valley that I could eat my way out of. I seen him eating church one night during service. Ralph Sexton's dad, Ralph Sr. was preaching on the bread of life and he got two loaves of bread and started slinging into the audience saying, there's enough for everyone, there's enough for everyone. And Brother Billy was going around behind him picking up that loaf bread saying, Lord God, Ralph, don't waste that bread. I'm gonna make me a sandwich out of it. And I said, you're eating and you're sleeping, you're resting. Somebody said, I just sleep last night. I slept just like a baby. I cried all night. I said, Brother Billy, how do you sleep with all this hell going on in your life? Listen to this. He said, son, the Bible said that the Lord never sleeps and the Lord never slumbers and there ain't no need me and him both staying up all night. So if God stays up all night and watches over my little affairs, why can't I just lay down? I said, Brother Billy, when the burden's heaven, the mountain's high, uh, do you count sheep? He said, no. I get out of the bed and I talk to the shepherd. I'm glad when you go to church and when you give it to God, that's all you can do. And so you might as well rest on his promises, stand on his promises, because I'm telling you, if God can't do it, we're in a mess anyway, but I'm glad that when I came, God can. And he went home and he rested it and he put it all in God's hand and left it there. And that night, that night, while he was in the bed sleeping, God stepped out of heaven, rolled up his sleeves, and bared his holy if you're keeping notes this morning, write down beside of this verse, divine intervention. You know what saved Israel that day? Divine intervention. And I believe what's going to save America, and what's going to save our future, and what's going to save our religious freedoms this morning is nothing more than divine intervention. You say, Brother Joe, what is that? That's when God steps in in a sovereign way and he does what we cannot do for ourselves. You say, has he ever done that before? From Genesis to Revelation, when man was at his worst, God was at his best. In closing this morning, can you imagine the news media interviewing King Hezekiah after this battle? Well, how did you win that war? He goes, I don't know. Well, what general made the right move? I don't know. What decision do you think you made that caused such a great victory? I don't know. I was in the bed asleep. Well, who did it? God, I believe he would say, back up just a minute, you want to know the one decision I made that, that I really feel like 
turned the tide. It was when I threw up my hands and said, God, I can't. But you can. He said, I gave it to God. And God did the rest. And there's one thing about it. When God does it, he and he alone gets the glory.